Riders ready, watch the gate. Hey, welcome back to the Dirty Knobs Podcast. I'm your host, Hollywood Mike Miranda, with my co-hosts, as always, JV James Vicente and EC Eric Carter. On this episode, we have the rivals, the friends, two guys that are very similar to each other, but really different. Uh, Eddie King and Pedlin Lee Medlin, both champs, both awesome, both my friends. Uh, Enjoy. Uh, I want to also send a shout out to everybody who signed up for the Dirty Fest. Uh, it is kicking butt, man. Come on. Uh, prices will go up uh, in a couple of weeks. So get in while you can get in. Oh, uh, yeah. Keep it dirty. <laughs> All right. For the first time, JV and EC are both a little late. And so it's a race to see who the last person is. Oh, my gosh. I think... Uh, He's, he's got to stop for chips and salsa. He's got to. Did I beat him? <laughs> All right. <laughs> I said, so I, I was... said, I had a little conversation with myself already recording. <laughs> I already had a conversation with myself. I said, I'm always wrong. So I'll say EC will win. <laughs> <laughs> I was, I was trying to beat him. Oh yeah. He's, he, he texted me and said, I'm in the driveway. But I go, you know, that's there was a chips and salsa, chicken. Yeah, of beer. course, of course. Yeah, who knows what's, who knows what's going to happen. Got the T-shirt. What's that T-shirt? Craig from? Allen. Craig. Craig oh, Allen. Yeah. 80s BMX. This is a Vector series, in honor of him, of course. Oh yeah. And then uh, I've got one regular one of um, oh. that's just an 80s. Oh. Is my bike? See it? Yeah. <laughs> In pieces. Well, yeah, little by little, I got my stuff. But what are, you, uh, what are you missing? Um, what's the direct link missing? Nothing. Tires, tubes. See those sweet Galindo bars. And the Galindo bars from Curtis. Love them. Uh, I got the stickers from the. Actually, the exact dimensions from from tim little thorpe he sent me the files i had them recreated yeah yeah so uh, i had the i had all the stickers um done exactly to this you know spec and um i just got to put it together yeah then get some white sweats i gotta wear white sweats and my jersey You gotta keep exactly. it real, man. You gotta keep it real. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh snap! Well, dude, that's exciting. Oh, we're just waiting for EC to join. Once he joins, we'll we'll quickly talk just for a second, and then boom, we'll bring these guys in. Okay, let's make a bet. You ready? Yes. He's got. He is chewing food when he logs on. I'm gonna take. He will be chewing food. I will not take on. that bet. I will not take that bet. <laughs> There's no way. I will not take that bet. Dude, I'm already in you for like seven dollars. Every time, every single time I lose this bet. No matter what side I take, I take the wrong side. Okay, okay, okay. I got another bet. You ready? Yeah. The first words that he says is, Hey boys. He's on. I was gonna see, I was gonna bet he doesn't make it to six. I was gonna say he doesn't make it to fifteen. But see, I would have right. lost already. Can't say, don't say anything. Let's wait till okay. he says something. Hey, boys. Here we go. Yep. <laughs> yep. All right, I lost. I, I, I got a dollar Some of back. That. I got it. You were quick. I had the first, back. but I did call the first part. Yes, but I didn't take that bet. All right. <laughs> All right, the first let me tell you what wait, it was. Wait. Yeah, what was the first bet? That you would well, be Mike chewing. Did, Mike didn't oh, yeah. take me up on it, but I said EC's gonna log on with food in his mouth. For sure. Chewing. That Got one him. he wouldn't take me he wouldn't take that bet. He wouldn't take that bet. Then I said, okay, he the first words he's gonna say is, Hey boys. 
<laughs> See? And See? I didn't say anything for a while, so you no, guys no, were Yeah, we, we were... <laughs> His suspense was killing me. Oh, man. All right. Well, fellas, we've got a we've got a banger. We do. We've got a banger yep. in the hangar. Yep. Yeah, I'm ready. What, All who, right. What do we got? What do we got going? Who do we got tonight? <laughs> Let's find out. Let's find out together. <laughs> Bringing them on yeah. in. All right. Oh, oh boy! Oh, Look at him. Look at him. We got an Oakley factory pilot. Studious. <laughs> Studious back there. Look at this guy. <laughs> back from the hairdress and everything. Just for you guys. Yes, I love it. Looking <laughs> tight. It's looking tight. Back to the gym. I got calling oh. me, telling me I'm on speed dial, dude. If you say something wrong. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look I at that. Time. I knew it. <laughs> All right. Well, hey. fellas, our special guest on tonight's episode, Pedlin, Lee Medlin, and Eddie King. Hollywood, you didn't tell me that I needed to bring boxing gloves for these guys. Oh, <laughs> man. This is good stuff. I like it. I can't wait to talk to these boys. Yeah. Well, uh, <laughs> the way this usually goes, fellas, is uh, JV will give us a little lowdown on who you are, what you did, what you do, and that business, the stats, and then we'll jump into it. All right. Okay. Let's see what I got, what I was able to dig up from the World Wide Web. All right. Start with Eddie. Uh, for everybody who doesn't know, Eddie King, 14-year career in the sport. Dude, if you don't start know Eddie King, you shouldn't be watching our podcast. Yeah. <laughs> 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 All right, should I just skip both of these guys? <laughs> no, no. Yeah, no, no, read them out. Read them out. They deserve their acclaims. For, yeah, I mean, for dude, sure. These guys are legendary, for sure. but man, if you don't know who they are, <laughs> okay, yeah, well, you're hey, in the wrong place. Hey, uh, first, the, look, first bike, I didn't know this until I read it. First bike was a Kmart special. Is this true, Eddie? Cost you $29.95. Uh, first my bike. Head. What was that? Cost my parents twenty nine ninety five, not me. Twenty nine ninety five. Wow. Won your first amateur race, uh, and then actually in your first B, your first pro race, you got a DNF, not because you ran into a racer, but because you ran into a photographer. That was on. You can uh, I didn't. Uh, I didn't get that deep with exactly where that was, but it it did say specifically. You got a DNF, and uh, it was it wasn't because of race, uh, you know, you, because you hit a racer, but because you ran into a photographer in the infield. I remember hitting a photographer one year, and uh, the face mask I was wearing cut my lip, it smashed against my face, and the sharp piece, piece of that I had to get a couple of stitches actually. Oof, man, John Kerr's always getting too close. Somebody, <laughs> <laughs> all right from from a, from sponsors. You had the bike, a few bike shop sponsors, DG, r and Torker, and then the big one, Diamondback from 1980 to 1989. I mean, that is incredible from the amount of time with one, with one company. Uh, you were a terrible 10 in 1983. Pro Rookie of the Year in 83, no. inducted to the Hall of Fame in 89. I counted 15 covers. 15? Give or take. Wow. Yeah. Close? Wow. I don't know. You you know, probably know more than I do. I mean, I just looked it up. But yeah, it said to, yeah, I ca tried to count them. Uh, yeah. Nicknames, King Edward. Oh, wait. Mike, how many nicknames do you think Eddie has? <laughs> probably. Well, I not the ones the that you ones gave. That I, I was going to say, I can think of a few that I gave him at Woodward Camp when we were roommates. But some of them I can't say on air. <laughs> Three three nicknames. Oh, chickers. <laughs> King Edward, Eddie the King, and then Silver Bullet, which we kind of knew. Uh, and then and for Lee, Frankie Lee Medlin actually says on your wiki Wikipedia, uh, nickname <laughs> pet, <laughs> nickname Pedlin Lee Medlin. But I thought that I remember your parents used to say Leadin on it, Leadin Lee. 
Did it not? Yeah, or? Maybe for one race or something, yeah. Okay, okay. Seven-year career, which isn't really that long, you know, when I was going through that. Seven-year career, race for Anah Anaheim Bicycle Center, Robinson for – for a little little bit of time probably want to hear what, how that story went gt kuahara rrs rally and as a pro back to kuahara and then maximum at the end sounds about right uh won the nba grands as a as a 14 and a 15 expert uh nbl grands as a 15x uh so that was aba sorry nba grands as a 14 15x and then nbl as a 15x ubr 15x and then ABA national number three in 79. And uh, looks like some knee injuries were, was really the, the cause of, uh, of your, your retirement. Yeah. Uh, trying to get out of the biz. Did I miss a, did I miss a race there? Mike thought maybe yes. world champion. Definitely. Yep. That's the world, one. Yeah. World champion, which I didn't catch there. So I apologize for that, but mm -hmm. that's a, that should be the first one <laughs> I should just say that, <laughs> but, but that, yeah, that's what I was able to dig up in a short period of time. Which but, I always uh, thought was funny. So you were the fastest one person on one weekend and you get to, for the rest of your life, call yourself a world champion. That's Needless exactly right. National title is much more <laughs> impressive. Let, let, let me start Dude. by saying that uh, I lived right down the street. Lee and I went to the same high school. We went to the same junior high school, same junior high. Yeah, because River, I, you guys are from Riverside, right? Yeah, that's correct. We both started, in the, we both started, uh, you know, racing, living in Riverside, and uh, I had I had been to Lee's house before I met Lee. Lee had a starting gate on a small dirt hill right right across the street from the front of his house, and uh, I had I had gone over there without him being there and actually rode off of his gate before I ever met him. Uh, but the story I wanted to start with was, you know, you're famous, you know, you're famous when you come around the corner, you know, you come around the corner and the big marquee sign on the corner, main corner in our, in our town had the big marquee sign of our high school. And uh, I remember the day I came around the corner going home and it said, uh, congratulations to world BMX champion Lee Bedlin. And I was like, yeah, um, <laughs> I'll never be that good. That was it, was, was, it was a big deal, man. It was a big deal to everyone in our city. It was a it was a huge deal. Well, the, the principal called me in and said, How come I never knew of this before? Like no, like I think a lot of people, I think Eddie even mentioned before I had heard, didn't even know he raced until something like that happened. A lot of people didn't know about BMX and Riverside, which is crazy, as you know. As many people came out of Riverside, everybody should have known, but they really didn't. No, I figured you'd didn't tell him because you didn't want him to know that you missed Thursday, Friday, and Monday. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, a, I mean, it was a big deal to have uh, to have that on the corner of a, two main streets in our town. And it was like, wow, I just couldn't believe it. I was like, wow, I hope someday I'm that good. Hmm. And hey, I'm, Lee. Still, I'm still not world champion, by the way. <laughs> Bad. <laughs> Well, they're still, hey, they're still dirty fast. <laughs> <laughs> you got a shot. Oh, man. Hey, uh, hey Lee, is it, yeah. is it true that you, you really only raced BMX for seven years? Yeah. Yeah. I, um, wow. Looking dude, back that's... on it, I, I think I should have did what Greg Hill did and maybe Eric Roop did. I just recently rode in your backyard at Greer with Bart McDaniels. And Eddie, you may agree to this too. I think we both probably should have turned pro at least a year sooner. By the time I turned pro, I was so burnt out. And then when I blew out my knee and all the rides disappeared, I was done. I was just over it. And I think if I would have turned pro a year before, who knows what would have happened. Well, yeah. What was the original injury? Like, Lee, do you remember like originally oh, yeah. what happened? I, I um, there's a lot of theories on, on how that or why it happened. Um, Mike, do you remember when Craig Kundig made that RRS, but it was a 16 inch? Do you yep. remember that? Yep. He took it to that, that I think it was an NBL nationals up at Carson city was one day. Reno was the next. Yep. And like a dummy. And he was my team manager on uh, Kuahara at the time. And there's my rookie year pro. I think Eddie was already racing a pro and I was racing B pro. And um, that weekend I was dominating and I was, 
Craig convinced me to race that bike in some little 16 inch race that weekend. And the next race after I rode that bike, I looped it off the first jump leading the main and blew out my ACL. Had no insurance, never got it fixed to this day. Since, since 1983, I haven't had an ACL. And um, wow. I kept trying to come back. Um, the, it, but I don't know if you guys remember, but in 83, the way to qualify to, to race for the number one plate that year in the car and all that, you had to just be in the top 29 in points. And it worked out great for me because even though I missed multiple months with that knee injury, I had made enough to where I was able to race at the grounds that year. And first I was, in, I was in Brian Patterson's main and I, you know, he was dominating as you guys know at the time and actually won the first moto transferred right out of there. And then riding behind Brent Patterson in the semi of the open class, there's actually a video on YouTube. I seen it. Um, I looped and looped out again and blew up my knee again. Um, two months later, I tried racing again and I did it again. And then I was just like, there's, it was, it. I mean, I've, I think I've shown you before, EC, my knee, how it just, it's spaghetti. Yeah. Um, oh. So yeah, I think I did probably what Pete, Pete did at the Worlds right. that, that year. And, and um, but he got his fixed. Yeah. Mm. That's crazy. You haven't gotten it fixed, dude. Yeah. And you, I mean, like as active as you are and I mean, all those years, like when we raced moto, and you didn't have an ACL. That's pretty crazy. Like when yeah, motor was a lot easier though, and especially when you're slow. Because you know, you're, <laughs> well, you you're faster not, than me, dude. You're not putting your foot out in every and turn like we had to do back much. then. Well, wow. the reason I wanted to make sure I had both of you guys on at the same time was because whether the magazines did it or not, or maybe it was just in my mind, you two were one of the one of the biggest rivals, amateur rivals that I could ever remember. I know that Oz had had made a big deal about it in BMX action, and uh, and I and I stopped and thought about it, and I told I told <laughs> I told Eddie this, and I said it to Eddie in front of a huge crowd of people. We were actually on a stage together in Australia, and I said, Eddie, I don't know if you know this, but I used to hate you. <laughs> <laughs> I Go said to- I said I hated Eddie King because I loved Lee Medlin. <laughs> and Lee Medlin was from my own, you know, you had to pick one side or the other. It's like being a Dodger fan or a Giants fan. You can't be, you can't, you have to hate the other one. So I did not like Eddie King. Didn't know him, didn't know anything about, just hated Eddie King. And, uh, and when I stop and think about it now, when I stop and think about it now, you two are very similar in so many ways. <laughs> would you, would, would you, would you two guys agree as well? Oh, it's incredible, the, the parallels between his life and my life. And, and yet, you were, you were in, the, in the magazines, shown as opposites. Uh, but, you know, neither one of you were big guys. Neither one of you were big. Or, I've never been big guys. Uh, you both are kind of quiet compared to, you know, you know. S- some of us. <laughs> and, there uh, are a lot of us. Yeah. <laughs> You, uh, you both rode with, you know, part of the reason you were both so very good is both of you made very few mistakes when you rode. I watched you both ride a lot. Um, you both started off on downhill tracks. I mean, that's really where you are known for being great at downhill tracks, where not everybody is. You know, you can be a fast rider in a lot of places, but if you can do well at downhill tracks, that kind of se- separates you. The fact that Eddie started at Rancho and... And Lee and I had the home track of, De- of Corona Downhill. You both were, were big players on major teams. And I'm gonna, we're going to ask you about that. You both went into real estate. And uh, you were both on the call before 601. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you guys are spot on. They were racing. Spot on. That's how you are. Uh, there's they also were, another connection. They were still think- racing. Yeah, they're still racing. And I mean, it was like seconds apart. Hey, but I'm not going to tell you who was first. I'll just say they were seconds apart. Hey, hey, Eddie, you remember me. I know you probably will remember this. Who was always behind the starting gate, probably 20 minutes early with this helmet already on? Jeez, I don't know. Me. I was always, <laughs> I was so afraid I was going to miss my race. I was helmet, I was ready to go way ahead of time. I've just always been that way. That metal flake helmet, I remember that a lot. 
<laughs> somebody somebody <laughs> asked somebody hey. asked about your helmet lee hey that thing was classic i wish i had that i got it for christmas this the christmas of 76 right before i started racing wow it looks like you got it before you started racing <laughs> it, it was like a it was like a vintage motorcycle helmet i remember it, it having a like a, a cityscape painted on the side it looked like one of those vans from the 70s with a little porthole window on the side. It literally looked like one of those, those scenes on the side of a van. <laughs> no way. <laughs> Where did, who painted that thing for you? Oh, dude, it came that way. Metal you know, and all. you know who did? My mom and dad probably got it oh at Zodi's or something. <laughs> Jemco. <laughs> Jemco, exactly. <laughs> I remember you used to race in Uvex <laughs> goggles. Yeah, I'm still mad about that picture that you posted. You see Eddie's goggles, they're badass. Oakley's all <laughs> perfect. And I've got my view backs with the, the strap hanging down here like a dude <laughs> around the first corner. Dude, how about Eddie's plate? All straight and perfect and the numbers all straight. And you got that square one on your red line bars kind of cocked off the side a little bit. Hey, I was like, yeah, Eddie. I went to Norda Vista. You know how it is. Yeah, come on, Riverside. <laughs> 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 oh man you guys uh you guys have one more thing in common you have you have a unique relationship with kevin mcneil which i'll talk about later yeah. <laughs> i look forward to that one yeah um you know the the watching watching either of you at your home track was something else you know eddie's eddie's home track of rancho san diego ec did you ever race rancho no i didn't i raced I don't like in 85, there was a downhill course there. And I don't think it was at Rancho though. It was a different place. Huh. There was a downhill BMX track in uh, San Diego. And they said it was like Rancho, but I never got to race that. Only Corona. Eddie, way, how, Eddie how would you describe, how would you describe Rancho, Eddie? Um, it wasn't too technical. It basically was just a left turn, right turn, left turn, right turn. And a nice gap and distance between the turns. I mean, it was just, and it was all downhill, basically. Mm -hmm. I don't know that, you know, the, no other tracks ever really tried to copy it to some degree, you know? It was just a great place. Because great, you know, pitches were taken there in the first turn, much like Corona. Yep. JV, it was, uh, it was the two, well, hold on, let me go back. And Lee, how would you describe Corona? Well, well, this is the thing. Let me let me back up a little bit. Eddie's one of the very few people, in my opinion, that were very good at both. Because I never won at Rancho. I absolutely hated Rancho, and this is why. It had an extremely tall gate, extremely flat start, a flat bottom of the track. There's only really one straightaway where you're going fast. That's between this, the first turn and the second turn, that straightaway. And as you know, I always ran very high gears. That's why Corona was perfect for me because you come out of the gate and it's like this, right? At San Diego, I, I ran so I could never get out of the gate fast enough because I always had too big of gears. If I did gear down, I, I, I have more fat, uh, strong muscles, not fast muscles. You know, some people have, you know, fast twitch, slow twitch. Um, so I was never able to do very good at, at Rancho, but Eddie was able to win at both. And that is pretty rare. Do you remember Kenny Battles? Of yeah. course. <laughs> Mr. 3916 at, mm. at Corona. Yes. Wow. <laughs> Two pedals and he's done. Yeah. So it really did take a certain person that could go fast with a, a start like that and a start like that. And um, he was able to do both. I never did win there. Wow. I, I remember at Rancho, it, yeah, it did have a flat, flat concrete gate. But then it had the, a super tall gate that yeah. dropped slow. Oh. And then it was sort of a, I mean, really a flat first straightaway. Very flat. And then it just, then it dropped into the first turn, which was a big banked right-hander, big banked right-hander. And then from there, it went downhill. And, you know, you're right, Lee, that after the, in the second straightaway, man, you'd be going so you're fast. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then there were jumps. There were jumps in every straightaway. And, wow. uh, and then the last straightaway was flat with a big jump in it. And, and Eddie, you were so fast there, so smooth. And I think you were so strong out of the gate. I, you know, another thing you guys had in, like I said, you had in common was you both were great out of the, you were good out of the gate. 
Yeah. Look good as all we had. We were so much smaller than everybody. And that's, I'm serious. If I didn't get a good start, I had no chance. Eddie, did you, did you do a lot of practice gates when you were young? Did you, did you have your own starting gate? Um, yeah. Yeah. As soon as they started coming out with gates, cause I started out with rubber band starts, you know, and flag starts. And then when the, the gates came out, um, I went down to uh, the hardware store and made my own gate with an ax handle on it and just wow. practiced, you know, put the chicken wire in the back. <laughs> yep. That's so good. I love I, it. <laughs> I think Lee's. I think Lee's dad must have stole your your blueprints. I was say, my dad built that that axe handle gate a long time ago. I don't know who was first, but I definitely was one of the first people to have one of those. I think, dude. I remember that thing. Two things I remember about it is one, it was rickety. <laughs> it was rickety, and two, we used the living shit out of it. <laughs> you, you well, know, you needed somebody to hold the gate, though, right? And then drop it. Yeah. Well, it yeah. was either Lee's dad, or if Lee's dad wasn't there, we would all just take turns. Yeah. But again, I remember going to Lee's house and doing gates. I I did more gates at Lee's house without Lee than I did with. <laughs> Seriously, I heard a lot of people at my house when I was never there, and I don't know where I was. <laughs> I don't, that's kind of weird. You're not the first person to tell me that. <laughs> I used to go there a lot with Richard Kerr. Yeah. Yeah. A friend, a good friend of ours. He, Richard Kerr, he, uh, from Rumblefish. Rumblefish. Uh, Rumblefish. Uh, he's got grandkids racing BMX now. Dude, I think his kid, I think his, his grandkids are fast. Like, yeah. Like win national winners. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> okay. So you guys both, how did the, how and when did the rivalry start? I'll hear Eddie's version first. <laughs> I think once Lee put on the GT jersey, and that was, <laughs> I don't know when it started to tell you the truth. So I'll give you my version because Eddie doesn't, doesn't know what I know. Um, just because, it, Mike, you're not the only one that hated him. I hated him. I think Eddie probably hated me too. It's funny, we're good friends now, but um, it was, remember Eddie used to come out to Corona Raceway on Friday nights? Race those mm -hmm. Friday night races. And remember, by 1977, when I started, he was already extremely famous. It was him and Brian Patterson dominating the 12 year old class. And um, luckily for me, he would come out on Friday nights to race Corona. And Rich Long was running the track by then. And he was actually running the track, literally doing the gate. Wow. I was um, just being sponsored by my mom and dad. And Rich Long told me if you can if you beat Eddie King tonight, I'm gonna I'm gonna give you a sponsorship. And that's when it was Anaheim Bicycle Center. And um, by the way, I didn't beat Eddie that night. I got a bad start because I was shitting bricks at that point because of that. <laughs> um, but he did end up sponsoring me, and that's how I ended up with the the you know the whole GT thing that happened a little little bit later than that. But Eddie had just won probably nine months prior. There's a great video on YouTube right now of him winning the California Cup at Corona against Brian Patterson. And um, so he was definitely the person to beat at Corona in our class. And then all of a sudden, good old Wells Intermediate School races um, got me racing Corona. And um, I just got very, very good at that track because that's the only track I was racing. Every week we would race the the school races in the morning, and then at two o'clock, Corona would have another race. That's when I think Mark Reap's parents um, were running it. And um, wow. yeah, that's and luckily Eddie came out. Because if it, if I'm gonna tell you right now, if it would have just been me winning the 12 expert class on Friday nights, I wouldn't have been noticed. But luckily, Eddie was coming out there, and I was beating somebody that mattered. I guess I don't think Rich Long would have cared if I just beat whoever. You know what I mean? Um, so yeah, it was, it was very, very lucky that he would come out to Corona on Friday nights. To me, that's when it started. He may not even know who I was at the time, but, but I did. <laughs> Eddie, who were you racing for? Or, or Lee, who was Eddie racing for at the time? Wheels and things. Okay. Yeah. Just to try and yep. get in my head about what, when, when this, uh, and the timeline got it. I remember one back one, one of the best looking uniforms in oh, BMX for sure. to yeah, this day. Yeah, those are pretty. Good I know. I like those too, man. Those wheels and things were cool. Really good. Gotcha. <laughs> and black and turquoise. Yeah. And then the white. It, it, it was just a great color combo for sure. 
you got to drop some pictures of that in. Oh, um, I will. And yeah. they had some iconic riders too back then. All so all the San Diego guys were great. Yeah. And I remember they'd come to they would come to Corona and it was a big deal. It, it would it was a big deal if if the San Diego guys came up or the NorCal guys came down, it was a big deal. That's so good. Yeah. Hey, I want to just uh, shout out to everybody that raced on the Wells Junior High School team. <laughs> I just want to, throw my, want to throw my little junior high school trophy, my first trophy oh, ever. No way. Trophy? Yeah, yeah. It says, Corona Raceway, junior high school BMX 2578, fourth in the semi. Yeah, so oh, mine was too. My first one was a fourth in the semi. First, first loser is what it means. It's You got a loser trophy. Yes. And dude, I raced for, I raced for, uh, let's see if that was, I raced for, Almost a year before I got a loser trophy. Um, I mean, I had to work hard just to get, I had to work hard and people had to fall for me to get that. I, I want to say that all these junior high school races were pretty cool because we raced all of the junior high schools in our town would all get together at Corona and race against each other. And it didn't matter if you were, if you were Lee Medlin or Eddie King, or if you were a student, you raced by your grade. If you were an absolute beginner or you raced nationals, you raced by your grade. That's and cool, Lee man. and Lee was so fast, so fast that they wouldn't let, let him race sixth grade or seventh grade. They made him race the eighth graders no. and, he, and he used to smoke them, he used to smoke <laughs> everybody. I never, I never, I can say this of all the junior high school races, I never saw Lee Medlin ever lose a race. And I only saw him in second place one time. And it was behind a, 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 a guy with a blue stroker with MX-60 mags. It was Lenny Carter. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's the only time we ever saw anyone ever get ahead of him. And, like, Lee just passed him, like, two turns later, Lee passed him and left him. Oh, it was over the big mama jump. Because Lee was not only the only guy – in the junior high school races that did two pedal starts, but he was the only guy that knew how to speed jump. He's the only guy that would lift his wheel before a jump. We were all just launching off launching. every day. <laughs> hey, you know where I learned that? Probably a year before I started racing, me and my, my brother somehow found our way to Snipes back in the day, Snipes. And there's a jump you launch off it, right? And I don't know who this guy is to this day, but some guy showed up while we were there riding one day and he was speed jumping everything. I'm like, what a goon. He's not even jumping off the jumps. What's he doing? And then, <laughs> not was, then we realized, <laughs> oh shit, it's faster. <laughs> <laughs> so was the junior high race teams only Southern California or did that go all the way up? It, it was only in our town. Oh, that's it. It was only the, the little cities that were right around oh, us. Oh, okay. Wow. That's right when mo the high schools had motocross teams. That's that's where all the, the big stars of the 70s um, in moto world in Southern California start got their start. Gotcha. Eddie, did your high school have that too? Like, did they have that down there? No. You just had wow, local that's... racing only. Yeah, just local races. Wow. That's well, that from, really is a small, like, you know, area that just raced against each other. Well, when you talk about the areas, though, like, it, when we say Eddie King was king of San Diego, you know, we think of San Diego as a little town, but it, it's a it's a bunch of towns, right? And yeah. Eddie, you were actually, you didn't live in San Diego, did you? No, I live in South San Diego, Chula Vista. Chula Vista. And, and who were the hottest guys, who were the big name Pros or big big name guys from the San Diego area at that time. I can think from, of a couple. From my own age group, are you talking no, about? No, no. It's like the like the like the who were the big names in the Chula Vista area? Oh, it was all it was all the Mechies. The uh, the <laughs> Ricardo Pedrosa, Bubu Moreno, Carlos Gomez, all those guys. All the Mechies. <laughs> all the Mechies, yep. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and and in our little town, Lee. We the little town of Riverside had some powerhouse racers. Well, yeah, I mean, it's you you have to know. So it's not because of Riverside. It, it's not because of Mike Moran. It's not because of Lee Medlin. It's because of Corona Raceway, right? I mean, if 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 Corona Raceway would not have been there, none of that would have happened, in my opinion. Mm. 
No, if they, I really honestly mm-hmm. think that because the track was so hard and so scary for a beginner, that it 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 did seem to breed a certain type of racer. That I mean, I always say, if you race Corona, you could go anywhere and race. Dude, you, I you, were, that. you weren't afraid of anything after Corona. I hated that place, dude. <laughs> I was like ten. I think I was ten when I raced it. It was 1980, and. Dude, I couldn't believe it when we rolled up. I, I literally couldn't believe it. I mean, you'd we'd heard I'd heard about it, right? I lived in Lakewood. I was, I don't know, an hour and something away, and I didn't really race a bunch of races. And it was like a triple crown series or something that, that we did. And it was like one of the races in the triple crown. And I was scared. I, I was already scared. And when I rolled in and looked up, I was like, you got to be shitting me. It was a little bigger <laughs> than La Mirada's. Dude, I heard, I heard the yeah. other podcast talking about how you're afraid to race at La Mirada. And then- I was, yeah, <laughs> exactly, man. Was, I mean, like, yeah, it was La Mirada on steroids, man. It's crazy. <laughs> JV, the, the, the mountain that you started up, half the guys would, you would push your bike, ha- you have to push your bike up. You couldn't right. ride You had to push your bike up. <laughs> and a lot of times, you'd stop halfway and rest. Wow. Dude. Wow. Yeah, it was and then that track was like almost a minute long, too. <laughs> yeah. And Lee, can you name some of the people? Like I asked Eddie to name the his Chula Vista guys. Can you name the Corona Raceway guys? Well, of course, Kevin McNeil, Leo Green. Those were when I first started racing, they were so much faster than everybody, going back to the two o'clock races, as we called it. Um, they would have to start way, way, way back by the fences where the moto guys would sit and kind of watch the BMX races. If anybody has been there, it's, that's gotta be what a hundred yards further back, hundred yards uh-huh. further back. Yep. And they would still, Kevin would usually win. Leo would get second almost every time. And, um, so they, Wait, would they started them. further, like, like playing from the blue tees. Oh, seriously, they would, in <laughs> other words, giving everybody a hundred yards start. In the head start. <laughs> Holy. <laughs> and then they dropped the rubber band and every, you they would take off when they saw everyone else take off. Yeah, as I say, they didn't have a rubber band. They just, once they seen the main gate drop, yeah. binoculars, it's time to go. <laughs> that that awesome. was B of X, baby. <laughs> yeah. Hey, are we gonna are we gonna have that class at Dirty Fest? Are we gonna have that set up? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I yeah. like the idea of it though. <laughs> yeah. So uh Lee, let me, let me, uh, I'm going to jump to Eddie real quick, but I want to come back. I'm going to ask you the same question. So Eddie, how, how, the, you know, in the beginning of this rivalry, you were the torker guy. How, how did that come about? How did you, how did you go from, how did you go from wheels and things, bike shop sponsorship to torker factory? Well, in, was it 76 when I won the California cup, I was on DG and another bike shop team from El Cajon. And then we made the move to wheels and things and with wheels and things, his connection with, um, they had a connection with R and R and they had a connection also with Steve Johnson and Torker. So that's when it became the Torker wheels and things team. Well, at least for myself, Doug Davis, uh, Bo Stevens and Aaron Stevens, I think at one time. So that's how that connection came. And then eventually it became full Torker. What, what, and the reason I asked you that is because now I'm going to ask Lee, tell me about how you went from a bike shop team to a factory team. You went from Anaheim bike shop to GT bicycles. So going back real quick to Steve Johnson, Eddie, tell them how old Steve Johnson was. He wasn't that old. He was probably in his early twenties. Early twenties. Same, same thing with, so the way that my whole GT thing happened is Rich Long owned a bike shop in Anaheim, Anaheim Bicycle Center. I've done the math. He was 25 years old. <laughs> and um, the whole, for a brief second there, you know, I had, there's a couple of pictures of magazines where I had a Robinson jersey on. Um, Chuck was trying to get, basically what it sounds like to me at the time, Chuck was trying to become what evolved into GT. He, I raced a couple of races with the, the Robinson jersey. And then Rich told me and my dad, hey, we're, me and Gary Turner are going to start our own team. We're going to call it GT Bicycles. And then, you know, Robinson obviously continued doing his thing and everything. But um, I think there for a brief second, 
Anaheim Bicycle Center could have easily turned into Robinson Racing instead of turning GT. So another similarity is that you guys rode for a bike shop and the bike shop owner through connection, whatever, basically became a factory team. Yeah. 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 It it's amazing. Crazy, uh, one more, one more yeah. similarity. <laughs> it's wild, isn't it? It really which, is. Which by yeah. the way, I'm pretty sure the early days of GT, Gary couldn't make that many frames out of his garage. Um, Torker was making GTs. Exactly. That's true. What? Look at yeah. that. I, I didn't know that. Torker yeah. also borrowed frames in the 80s, also. I knew that. I knew they were making they were making Haro bikes. I saw the jigs up in the jig. It was basically the same Absolutely. bike. Rich Long told me and my dad one time, I will never sell a kit bike. Because that was, you know, those, those are Walmart bicycles. Nobody's going to sell a kit bike. These, these are, you know, GT BMX. Those, these are real bicycles. They're not going to sell a kit bike to anybody. Yeah. <laughs> and then the Interceptor came along. Yeah, the, the Mach 1. The Mach yeah. 1. Yeah. The Mach 1. Yeah. He couldn't fill those boats <laughs> fast enough. No, like like Eddie like Eddie King racing on a a Viper <laughs> on the hundred ninety nine dollar Viper bike didn't happen. You're uh we were talking JV and I were talking earlier about uh about the bikes that you guys rode. I don't know Lee did was your stock was your stock frame? Yeah, I had a couple prototypes throughout the years, but. To be honest with you, I don't remember the prototypes evolving into anything different than what was already there, to be honest with you. I, I remember that you had a small bottom bracket. You had a you had a, a pro size frame, but with a small a European bottom bracket. Oh. Right? Yeah. yeah. Because he because Lee ran three piece cranks, three piece alloy cranks. <clears throat> and then uh go ahead. I said I had I had a GT actually that was the the same way. I think it was one of you know, um, Shockley was the welder for GT. And um, I think his son, uh, Robbie, Robbie Shockley, I, we, we went to there. He, he was welding. Um, what was his name? His name was Sam, right? Sam Shockley. Yeah. Yeah. Sam was a welder for GT and he, and uh, we went over to their house, man. I couldn't believe it because Sam, I think he was welding them in his garage at the time. And so we went and picked up a bike from, um, from them. And I think it was one of Robbie's old bikes and had a, whole drill i remember it had a hole drilled in the seat tube so that you could run the cantilever brakes and i thought it was the craziest shit man <laughs> but yeah my my gt also had a small bottom bracket so i don't know if that was a stock thing or if i was on some type of mm -hmm. prototype as well like lee well, even the cyc storm or whatever they called it back the ronnie ames bike that the you know the very very early be prior to to the whole gt thing that had a that had a European bottom bracket. I don't think that was anything real unique. I think those Eddie, well, wasn't your DG? Didn't it have a, a European bottom bracket? Yeah, yeah. Your, your is cranks probably. Segino. Segino. Yeah. That was Segino. Now, Eddie, w when you went from Torker to Diamondback, did did you ride it? Was that a custom frame or was that a a one off? Was that a stock? Stock. <laughs> At that time, we had a lot of prototypes that were being sent to us all the time. You know, Sandy was just creative and trying to think out of the box and make some subtle changes here and there. So, yeah, our, our bikes at the time were mainly all factory because we had different prototypes that we were running all the time. And sometimes we would get different riders to ride the different prototypes, you know, and that's kind of the reason why we had the gold you know, prism tape decals on the factory bikes and you couldn't get those on production bikes. So it made it a little, thing where it's a little more cooler, I guess. I don't know. I remember those stickers. Hmm. Couldn't get them. Yeah. Well, our, our mutual friend, uh, Tracer Finn, wanted me to ask you this question to both of you. What, what you Obviously, you both won a lot of races and you raced for a long time around the world. Do you have a favorite win? I could only guess what Lee's is. Eddie, I, I have no idea what, what would be your favorite win. Um, I don't know. I like the California Cup in 76. I like the ESPN race 
in Waterford Oaks just because it was ESPN and and Bob Osborne predicted me to win, even though it was my second race. Uh, I don't know where he should have bought a lottery ticket that day, but uh, <laughs> you know those two races. I've, I think- I've got one for you, Eddie. That, that should be one of your favorites. And after I say this, you're probably going to agree. The '78 Super Nationals that the that were the um, the sports the sports center next to where the Clippers used to play. Um, you know. Oh yeah. Uh, uh, at the LA Sports Arena. At the Sports at the Arena. Sports Arena. You, yeah, I remember you, that. Yep. You, you doubled that day and got third in the trophy dash as a 13-year-old. And I remember leaving there, me and my dad looked at each other and said, well, because at that point in 78, I had won, that, that year I won seven out of the nine nationals. And Eddie really handed it to me that day. And I remember going back on, well, I got to go work because there was no question. Because a 13-year-old getting third in the trophy dash. That's crazy. Is really hard to do. Do you remember that race, Eddie? I don't remember that race. I remember. No, I don't remember that race. The one thing I will tell you, though, I was really. I wanted to win the trophy dash very so badly because I knew that, you know what, because they grouped all the winners in there and I just wanted to win it and I never got to do it. Uh, Greg Hill got to do it at 14. And that was kind of like, you know, I was like, man, I got to do it. It's like a bigger statement to say that. As a young amateur, a lower age amateur, to go there and beat the big guys in the trophy dash, because they, they got nothing, they got everything to lose and nothing right. to for it, you know. But Greg Hill did it at fourteen, and the only time I came close to doing that was at Craigmer, New Jersey. I got the whole shot and everything, and by the end of the first straight, I think Cosmo and somebody else went by me, and that was it. I was like, you know, my eyes were this big when I came out of the gate, and I didn't see anybody. <laughs> that, that trophy dash concept is awesome though man i mean well, yeah <laughs> so so that's funny you mentioned that race that the greg hill one so that was everybody knows the the infamous weiner mountain super nationals and yeah. in 77 so that would have been my very first national ever but we got there too late to sign up so we didn't get to race i probably saved myself getting hurt because a lot of people got hurt that's so one that's year what later one year later, that was my first national win. And I think that's my favorite. It was my very first one. And I was in that trophy dash when Greg Hill won that. And that was massive. It was in the dark. Yeah. They, you couldn't see anything. Schwinn, there's a Schwinn commercial. If you remember, Eddie, they filmed that whole weekend. Schwinn yeah. filmed that very famous commercial. But yeah. but yeah, I won the 13 expert. He won the 14 expert. And he won that trophy dash. I, I did get third, I think, in that race, actually. Um. That to me was my favorite just because it was at Weiner Mountain, even though it was Weiner Mountain 2, it wasn't quite as dangerous, yeah. but it was my first one. Uh, I would have bet that you would have said it was the World Championships. I was actually <laughs> very upset at that when I won that World Championship. So that weekend, um, and Eric probably knows this about me a little bit, I'm kind of a Strava whore. I love stopwatches. <laughs> I love stopwatches and so that's the first race I could I remember being at they had a big basically stopwatch every single race the entire weekend was being clocked and it kept going back and forth between me Andy Patters, Patterson Denny Owens and Pete Lonkarevich and you notice I didn't say Greg Hill Stu Thompson or any of those guys the amateurs at that that weekend were putting down better times Wow. And I won the I won the 16 expert. Eddie got second at that race and they put first and second in the trophy dash. And Pete won his class. Pete got the whole shot. Eddie was in second. Eddie was looked like he was probably passing for the lead and they both went down. And that's how I won it. And I remember being so pissed off because I truly felt like I was the fastest guy that weekend because I did lay down the fastest time. Rennie Roker actually sent me, I still got it a clock with a letter after that race for, for not only winning the world championship, but putting down the fastest time of the whole weekend. Wow. But it didn't happen in the trophy dash. I got lucky to win the trophy dash because they crashed. So I was actually mad at the finish line. I was like, this is bullshit. I want to <laughs> win it fair and square. I saw they crashed. Uh, hey, JV, I, I was just thinking about this. Have you ever seen a trophy dash? No, oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, I yeah. Don't know if you, yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. We, their trophy dashes were yeah, they were did. around. They did them in the mid to late eighties as well. Oh, I don't remember that. They I did some of them, yeah. But maybe. it wasn't it wasn't hyped up. I, it just didn't have the hype of back 
like in the early eighties when those guys were winning. That was, I mean, that was the, that was the race. In the seventies, yeah. that was it. It was, you raced to get to the trophy dash. Yeah. So you, and could, that was, that was what you wanted to win was the trophy dash. Right. You were the, you were, that was, you were the champion of the whole thing. Yeah. Well, that's why the pros <laughs> always, always ended up with the number one plate with, with NBA. Cause if you won the trophy dash, it paid 400 points from what I remember. But if you win your main, it's like 250 points. Yeah. So like in 78, Stu won the title and I don't remember how many races he won, but every race he won, he also won the trophy dash. Right. So he was d- doubling up. So, yeah. <laughs> he was getting triple <laughs> points on the weekend. Exactly. <laughs> Having a 650 weekend. Yeah. Well, I, I, I don't know if you you and Eddie have seen the registration or, or the or the website for the Dirty Fest. But the dirty, if you'll see it, you qualify for if you win, there's like five classes. If you win, you go to the trophy dash. We're gonna oh, have nice. a trophy dash at Dirty Fest. Nice. Oh, I love yeah. it. Nice. But we yeah. won't have cars with lights on lighting the track, so you can see <laughs> we'll be ending early on Sunday. Don't worry. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> so I I was just trying to like look stuff up really quick, just because I think as a lot of people that listen, making it on a factory team is like the pinnacle. It's super hard, but staying on one for a long period of time is like almost even harder. And when I said nine years on one team for Eddie, I mean, I'm like trying to think what other guys have been on, were on factory, you know, the same factory team for that long. And I only got one other guy that I saw that I was able to find. Can you think of any guys? Can you think of anyone else that's been on a, the same team for longer than nine years? I can only think of one guy. I can only think of one guy. Yeah, I only got one. Who do you got? I got Gary Ellis. Uh, Gary is Gary 86 to 98 on GT. Wow. Yeah. Wow. 86? 86 to 98. He was on 80 in GT in 86. I don't know if that's right. Uh, yeah. was he on when? Well, when did his reign on Huffy end? That's he went from Huffy to GT. That was 84 85. So I think 86 is, is correct. Maybe well, right. It says oh, that's here, how you save money on jerseys as a, as yeah. a factory. Uh, 83 to 84 Kuahara, 84 yeah. Flying W, 84 to 86 Huffy, 86 to 98 GT. Yeah, that's about right. Hold on a second. I just thought of something. Eddie and Lee, you guys have never, I know you never raced on the same team. But do you have any shared teammates? Oh, it's funny you say we never raced on the same team. Eddie, this is, this may be something you don't even know. Did you know I was supposed to be your teammate in Diamondback? No. Oh. Sandy, Sandy called my dad and said, we're starting a new team. It's going to be called Diamondback. It's going to have Raiders colors. Um, <laughs> Eddie, you and Eddie are the future of the sport as far as we're concerned. Harry took my ride. Wow, I didn't know that. down because I hated your ass. Swear to God, that's why I said no. You should have took it. I'm not going to race for the freaking <laughs> devil. Are you are with the devil? That's, that's how ridiculous the rivalry was. I would not even think about riding on the same team as Eddie at that time. Oh we, we turned down Sandy Finkelman and said, absolutely not. <laughs> wow. Seriously. And then, and then within a month here, cause you were there before Harry. No, Harry was there Three first months. there. It was David Clinton started the team. And then it was uh, Bo Stevens, Doug Davis, and then Harry came on. And then me and Pete came together. Yeah, but then the team when when Dave Clinton was all part of that was with totally different colors. I don't even consider yeah. that the same thing. Yeah, exactly. He was the I'm original, the Sandy Finkelman one. Right. No, that started out with uh, Davis, Leary, and Aaron Stevens, mm. and then myself and Pete came along at the same time. I can't believe, or maybe Pete took the ride. Then I cannot believe Sandy never told you that. Wow. I can. I can believe he never told him that. Yeah. yeah. I, I was thinking, you guys, I can't think of any shared teammates that you guys have either. Right? That's pretty rare in our sport that you never had a teammate that you shared. Yeah, I can't think of anybody. Nope. Not really. I mean. No. Well, first of all, he, you know, Eddie raced for the same team for so long. That that team was, there's people didn't really come and go from that team. No, that was no. amazing. 
Did it's you ever almost it. leave? Did you ever almost leave the team? Me? Yeah. 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 yeah there was, uh, I think, a rumor in 84 that uh, they had spotted my car at GT. Oh. And I had met with Rich Long. But that was actually not true. But it did help me. But I did meet with SC, I want to say in 84, I met Mike Devitt and Scott Breithop. And that was my leverage right there for a new contract. And that was true. And then, you know, Toby Henderson got the deal after I turned it down. So the Henderson hauler and mm. all of that, that was, uh, you know, in hindsight, if you look at it now, I mean, you look at what the two teams are, maybe SC would have been pretty good. <laughs> no, I don't, I don't know. think so. Not at that yeah, time. I don't know. But not at that, you know, exactly. Not at that time. I looked at, you know what, what team's going to be around in the long run? You know, well, I'm not going to have problems getting paid. I'm still going to get, you know, food money every weekend when I leave. It's a solid right. place. They're selling bikes. They got four big warehouses all over the country. Three, you know, four big warehouses in the country. They got the distribution down. It's yeah. like uh, you can't. Essie was, it. Essie was, was I mean, all over the place. Kind of in shambles at that point. <laughs> well, yeah. Essie always looked big, but never was. Right. Yeah. Right. Now, Lee, you had you had you went GT, and then from there to GT. Where did you go from GT? Uh, I went back and forth between GT Kuhara. and Kuahara twice. Yeah, Kuahara twice. Yeah, twice. I was on Kuahara the first time with Kevin McNeil, Leo Green. Man, I mean, that was a big team. There was a bunch of us over there. Um, but then when Craig Kundig ran the second team after Mark Silverberg decided to, I don't know what that whole deal was, but he's no longer the team manager. Craig, they hired Craig Kundig. That's when me, Clint Miller, um, Gary Ellis, Troy Daniels, Derek Garcia. I mean, we had a very, very good team there. Um, and I was actually supposed to ride for GT that year too, but I just, you know, my problem with GT, I, you know, in retrospect, was probably a huge mistake because obviously they became one of the biggest companies. I was, I was just too early in their in their monster of a company. That's that was the problem. Um, and Kuahara came along with a huge budget for the time. You know, they they, I don't know where they got the money because they didn't sell that many ET bicycles. I can I can assure you that. Um, but they were they were paying. And it made sense. And, and, and then way, Maximum. My favorite bicycle, my Kuohara. Was, was it Kuohara? It really was. I really, really liked that bike. Wow. And then you, and did, then you had Maximum that tried. They were trying to. They well, actually spent some money all, trying to make a team, right? Well, first, I mean, ours, I was pretty much done at the end of 83. I lost my ride. Craig called me up. It was, I, I remember the breakup call. Um, basically, you know, I was hurt so much. They knew I was damaged goods. I was no use to them anymore, which I don't blame them looking, you know, in retrospect. Um, so they weren't renewing my contract. So I just, I, I was done. So the whole maximum thing and actually maximum sold to another guy, the Vaughn racing. And remember that there's, there, there's a company called Vaughn that kind of took over the maximum. So there's actually a picture somewhere where I'm actually wearing a Vaughn Jersey as well. Mm. Um, but that was after I was already done. I was doing drywall. You know, I quit racing. I went into drywall, doing drywall with my, my brother, my dad, my uncle, and, you know, the, that thing. And um, I would just show up. Mike, you remember those Thursday night races out there at Elsinore? Yep. I would, I would show out there on, up on Thursday. Dude, they were paying. We were making like 100 bucks on a Thursday night to, to win there. Um, <laughs> so I would just whatever, whoever would just give me a bike. So I'd have a bike to ride. I wasn't training. I wasn't doing anything. I was working all week and then showing up on Thursdays. And so those rides aren't really rides they 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 weren't really much of anything what about raleigh yeah i was gonna say yeah so yeah the whole raleigh thing that was not very good it was um <laughs> it was real bad actually they well they talked oh, hold big. on hold on i want i want to make sure everyone sees my face <laughs> that was not very good <laughs> oh, that was not very good that was <laughs> wow um i mean if you've seen those pictures we we look like a nascar team with just patches everywhere. And every one of those patches were supposed to be putting money in our pockets. I raced for them for I don't know how many months, seeing very, very little money. So yeah, I was pretty much done with them pretty early on. 
Mm. Uh, and the bike was horrible. The bike wasn't very good either. The geometry was really weird. Yeah, I don't I don't think yeah. anybody went to Raleigh and set it on fire, did they? Don Jolie. Yeah. Was, yep. Our good friend Don Jolie. Yeah. Rest in peace. Yep. Yep. And Kevin McNeil. He was on Raleigh. <laughs> no, but I just want to say his name again. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is he on, I, What's it? I use it as a segue to talk about you two both have a very unique relationship with Kevin McNeil. In that, uh, let's see, let me start. Well, I'll start with Lee, then I'll go to Eddie. Eddie's already laughing, dude. Look at him. <laughs> well, Lee, you know, growing up in the same town, but I I really didn't see you guys ride together much. You you weren't, yeah, you we rode a lot. He he would show up on my door pounding on my door time to do starts i was gonna say starts yes a lot yeah. of starts yeah. but i mean like when i would see i would see you out riding or we would see you know we would ride together kevin didn't ride with us and uh sometimes when i'd ride with kevin or i'd see kevin out riding i didn't see you with him i saw That's you both point. separately I, I don't remember why most of my riding days was with my best my best friend lance mccoy Yep. I don't know if you remember Lance. Yeah, of course, Lance. We'd be at my house every day. We would do everything together. And then my neighbor across the street, David Schwick, he was he was the gate starter typically. Um, but you're right. Not looking back on it, I didn't write a lot. I mean, you and I didn't write a lot together for that matter, being in the same town. Or nope. the Clovo brothers, we didn't write a lot with them either. I remember writing more with, with Richard Kerr and Lance and you know, those kind of guys. But you know, back then, I don't know about you, but I didn't like riding with the guys I had to race against too much. Hmm. I just didn't. I don't know why. That and Kevin was a little weird. <laughs> hold on, no. hold on. I want everyone, everyone to see my face. <laughs> so, so, so Kevin was a little. You usually, you usually ask hold on. Was your, your was best and worst teammates, right? You. I always hear you say that. Kevin McNeil is the answer to both. <laughs> how was he the best and worst teammate yeah well he's the worst just because he's got a screw loose we all know it and it's, it's <laughs> he's always been that way he's the greatest guy in the world though but he's just been and when i say a screw loose it, this dude was was working he, he was like an olympic athlete back then this guy worked so hard he's probably the reason i quit early because he burnt my ass out Be, between him wanting to train so hard and then that injury, um, but he was, you know, I mean, he was a great, great guy, but he, he clearly had some issues for sure. I, I really feel bad where he ended up in his life because he could have been, you know, who knows what he could have been, but, um, but no, but he, so yeah, he was probably the best and worst um, for a lot of different reasons. Well, what I learned, what I learned about from Kevin was I did know that on that first tour that ever went out that went when uh who, who was uh, i know that eddie was on the tour and i know kevin was on the tour who else was on that tour eddie um for what ages i mean well the one the one with kevin mcneil you and kevin mcneil Greg, Greg hill jeff graham um who else sean me picture out and look at the bus yeah i'm trying to think craig Ade, uh some other guy from tucson Stuart, um, I said Jeff Brown. There was about 13 guys that finished that tour. Oh, my God. It, wow. Well, in a bus. <laughs> in a bus. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. Ke Kevin, Kevin had shared with me uh, not that long ago with Eddie and I sitting on a bench. We had Kevin on a, on a speaker phone and – Kevin had told us that he really, he really uh, had a, you know, really liked Eddie and had a, a lot of ad admiration for Eddie and uh, was, uh, was just a big fan of Eddie back then. You can tell the story. You know uh, the point. That's, that's, that's what I got to say right there, my man. <laughs> he was a big fan of Eddie's. Um, and it's easily, you know, it's easy to see why, you know, it was, Eddie was super fast and a nice kid and had long, pretty hair. <laughs> that's all i'm gonna say i'm not gonna add any more to that. <laughs> oh man so eddie i gotta ask you the question your, your best and worst teammates 
<laughs> that, um, that could be one and the same person too just like we all know who he's gonna say so Crazy. seriously eddie who 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 was your best teammate best teammate Crazy Harry and the worst teammate, probably Crazy Harry. I can see why he's pretty, pretty, has always been a very intense individual. Yeah. Very, how is it? Very high and very low. Very mm. high, very low lows. I guess that's the only way to describe it, I guess. You know, Pete was a lot of fun as a teammate, you know, off the track, on the track, <laughs> even at, you know, all the shenanigans after the races and stuff. Oh yeah. Pete... <laughs> how about Pete? Pete has a new Pete Long. How about, shout out to Pete Longkarovich has his own podcast out now. I so, saw that. Yeah, fantastic. Saw it. Yeah, he's uh, he's had his first guest, Andy Patterson. So it was great. Glad to have wow. another BMX brother out there doing this. No, that's good. Pistola. Pistola's yeah. got his got his own potty, man. I love it. Yeah. Well, let me, uh, I, I've had, I've had having raced for as long as I got to and, and had a lot of places to go to and a lot of roommates. I'll tell you one of my all time favorite roommates was Eddie King. We had a, we, we shared a, we shared a, a room together we, in a, at Woodward camp for, oh a, for a long, long time. And it was awesome. And, uh, you, fr from going from a guy that I hated. I didn't know, but I hated him. And then a rival on the track when he turned pro, again, I really didn't, I didn't hang around Eddie. I mean, Eddie was, Eddie was over in his pits and I was in mine and we didn't really, we didn't mash up together much until Woodward camp. And then it was, uh, it, I mean, it, it, by the, by the second or third day, it was like, oh, this guy's awesome. And uh, <laughs> we used to have, uh, and every night at about 6.15, it was, it, I hated him again <laughs> because every <laughs> night at about six fifteen we did gate starts. <laughs> the Woodward, Woodward World World Championships. It was the Woodward World Championships every single night, wasn't it, JV? Yeah, yeah. And, that was and actually it was a, pretty go ahead. fun. Yeah, no, no, go ahead. It, it was a, it was a big, it was a big deal because you know you wanted to, you know, not only show off in front of the campers. But there were a lot of gymnast girl staff to watch on the fence. That's, that's, that's the motivation. Are, yeah. And, you know, Look at Eddie slapping too. Yeah. <laughs> and before that, you know, before Eddie, it was, you know, beating Mike Polson, uh, Joe Bomber, and Greg Grubbs. And Greg, yeah. Yeah. I'm not saying they were easy to beat all the time out of the gate, because we only raced to the first first turn. But it, it was it was a different level when Eddie got there. <laughs> yeah, those big yeah. legs, man. Intimidate you. <laughs> God, he was so strong, out, so strong out of the gate. Remember yeah, the time? Eddie, did those gymnasts teach you how to do a backflip? Because I know they taught Mike and, and Tommy Brackens how to do a backflip. Oh, no, not me. I'm not doing no back. <laughs> no, I think Eddie was learning how to do a front flip. <laughs> Remember the time you spent the summer in the infirmary at Woodward? So great. <laughs> so one, great. That one girl radar climbed into the back of the infirmary and tried to crawl through the, the small cubby hole window. That... <laughs> yeah, you know, the best part about this is I get to right. edit all this out. <laughs> <laughs> you know, let's see if we're gonna do some editing. How about the fact there's there's another connection on this on this podcast? <laughs> two, two guys on this podcast got got crabs from oh, from this, from the same bed at camp. Oh my God. That wasn't me. Well, I I took over that bed though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't, this will be all edited out for sure. This will be edited. Out. <laughs> yeah, Jamie. <laughs> Jamie got in there. Fuck! I was like, "What the?" Out, Mac Win. Every time, because oh, Sunday night, the new campers <laughs> and everything else, and. I would get the report from Matt Quinn on like, you know, I did a couple hot new chicks here this this week for the whole camp. Lee, you had one uh, poor Lee he had one girlfriend his entire world. One girl didn't you have one girlfriend in high school? One from junior high school and you're married to her now? And um yeah, I've been with her since uh, like 
the grand's an 82. Yeah, but wow. no, Eddie, you remember the, the other girlfriend I used to bring around to the races when, when we first started? She was older than me. And I remember you you made a, a couple comments. I remember Bob Osborne asked you something about what, I don't remember how I worded it, but what's Lee's biggest weakness? And you said girls. And it's because I, I think it's because I had this 15 year old girlfriend. I was like 12. <laughs> <laughs> hey, speaking of girls, hey, me and Eddie have another thing that's that's in common with when it comes to girls. Oh, Eddie, do you remember um, a girl probably pretty consistently were, were beating you when you're probably 11 or 12? Because I know I, one was beating me at Western Sports Arama. Kim Johnson was beating me. And I think Crystal Bradshaw beat you a few times, right? No, Liz Torres. Liz Torres? No Crystal Bradshaw? Not that I can remember. No? I thought she used to... No? Okay. It was Liz Torres that beat me. Yeah. Oh, for, for me, it was Western Sports Room. I did not want to race Kim Johnson. Dude. Lee, do you remember uh, the first national I ever went to? I oh, know. Take that back. The, not the first national I went to. It was the national I went to, though, with to Bakersfield. And I rode with you, Kim Johnson... And Kenny, the long-haired guy on Anaheim Bike yeah. Shop. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I remember you, you was, guys. Was, was Kim's dad driving us? And no, I think, no, I think Kenny was driving. Or no, Rich was. I'm sorry, Rich, Rich Long was driving. Rich Long was. Is that the one where we kept pulling over for hitchhikers and, and waving them to the back of the truck? And as soon as they'd almost get there, we'd take off. Yeah, remember we ran and then we were getting gas at a gas station and they come pulling one, up. One, <laughs> caught up. Oh my yeah, God. that was a little, a little embarrassing. Oh, uh, you know, I'll tell you, embarrassing was we when they came to pick us up. I was at your house and Rich came up. Rain, Rich picked us up in the van, mm -hmm. and I was there, I got there early in the dark, and and my dad left. I was just standing across the street by the starting gate. I had my bike. And my so-called helmet bag was all my stuff rolled up in a paper shopping bag. <laughs> and and I remember at the at the when we got done racing, we're on the way back, and and Richard Long goes, Hey kid, come here. And he goes, That's pathetic. He just goes, You're pathetic. He goes, and he reached in and he gave me a Robinson. It was a Robinson helmet bag with a broke and a broken zipper. But it was better than what I had. Yeah. So he was like, hey, hey, retard, come here. <laughs> Still that bag. Put your shit in here, man. Get out of here. I just think I just embarrassed him, man. I was like, oh, it's my first helmet bag. Wow, going to races, going to races back then was a lot different than it is uh now or even later. You know, uh I, I wonder how many kids, like thinking of Eddie and and like that trip, Lee, how many kids were just left to themselves with a with the, the responsible adult that was 22, 23 years old, yeah, right? Crazy. Craig Kundig, to, to me, was the adult, right? He was the adult in the room. Yeah. And, and looking back now, he was 23 years old. Yeah. 23 years old, driving us to the ABA Grand Nationals in Las Vegas. We were in the back of a Ford Ranchero. Not a big pickup truck. It was the back of Ford Ranchero. Doing well over 100 miles an hour the whole way, and throwing beer cans out of the window the whole way. <laughs> and we, you know, myself, uh, Joe Claveau, Kurt Claveau, and uh, Keith Peel sitting in the back of the ranchero with the oh, bikes. Wow. Oh, damn. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. It's they did it. Now. We lived it. <laughs> Something yeah. similar to that. I was um, in Craig's truck. He had, at this point, he had the Toyota with the camper shell. And we were going to a race in Utah at, at Salt Lake. And it was, we were about a couple hours away and I was driving and, and Craig was in the passenger seat. And I don't know how many kids were in the bed of that truck underneath that, that camper shell. And I fell asleep at the wheel. Mm. Next thing I know, Rick, uh, Craig Kundig's reaching over, grabbing the wheel and putting us back on the freeway. <laughs> Real wow. scary. Cause I, wow. I fell asleep at the wheel, sleep, you know, driving all night. I was probably, you know, 16, whatever it was. My gosh! Surprised wow. we all survived these these trips. I think back of that SE, that big bus going, and then Eddie asleep, and Kevin McNeil running his fingers through his hair. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I got to edit that out too. God dang! This is going to be like a twenty minute episode after all this editing. <laughs> yeah, I'm really grateful that I grew up in the neighborhood with Lee Medlin and Kevin McNeil. And Leo Green, I, and with Richard Kerr, Rumblefish, 
Rumblefish. And, you know, uh, there were certainly some other guys, Donnie Gerritsen, who had the Jones track. And, you know, Joe we were Kurt lucky. Claveau. Joe and Kurt Claveau, you know, Craig Kundig having the bike shop, Keith Peel. You know, we had uh, Tom Mosqueda. Yeah. Tom Let's Mosqueda. Get, Tom. Who, Tom Mosqueda, who, who single handedly saved my ass a few times. I mean, he was, he was like my factory mechanic, man. He would dial my bikes in so sick. Dude, he was my factory bodyguard. I could take people out in the semi and no, not worry about getting my ass kicked because he would step in and beat them up for me. <laughs> so when when Mike started winning everything, when he be pro, we would all be at Thomas Geta's house in his front yard. Um, this is before Mike's bug got stolen from the LAX airport. Um, it's Stu Thompson would be there. Mike Miranda wrenching on that damn car looking back at and, and don't forget who lived across the street DJ Greg <laughs> yep yeah lived across the street um, yeah he was <laughs> that's pretty wild I mean think about this I mean you know Stu Stu was re- living in Riverside at the time and, and Stu and, and Mike became very good friends because you know Stu was such a legend nobody he was like one of those people you just didn't see around that often he's always such a quiet guy and then I'd go to Tom Mosqueda's and he'd be in the front yard with Mike working on his damn bug. It was kind of trippy. <laughs> yeah. Tom, you know, and Tom Mosqueda was, was an old friend of Kevin McNeil's and Robbie Dominguez. Do you remember him? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Another, another big fat, fast, super fast guy that was great at locals. Great at Corona. Wow. Yep. Yeah. Uh, well, you listen, you two, you two had storied careers. You won big races you guys, obviously, you know, the feeling was mutual, I guess, uh, that you you were rivals. Yeah, I mean, that was the rival in my world. Um, I mean, you know, like Rod Beckering came along and Mike Polson. I mean, there was a million. Our class, Eddie, don't you agree? I know everybody's yeah. a little biased on this. Don't you think our age group had to be the most stacked throughout the years? I think at that time, definitely. I mean, you could throw in Timmy Judge also. And Chris Matt Hopkins. Harris. Chris Hopkins. Yeah. And then, you know, you can kind of compare it side by side with uh, Carter, my brother, and that whole group of yeah. age riders, Darwin Griffin and Steve all them. Yeah. yeah. When you get when you get a pack of riders that are so competitive and so good, it just makes that whole age group excel at another level. Yeah. Yeah. You, you it's know? it's true, man. We we were like the second coming of your guys' group. Yeah, because yeah. I remember seeing the terrible thing that picture i believe you guys took that at yeah, awesome. yeah throw in sanity too yeah and i was just in awe i was like oh my gosh man like those guys are so fast i remember thinking there's there's no like how do you get that fast it blew me away but it's weird how you say eddie like you get if you get over a little threshold and you start to be like in the mix it like it, it's like getting, it's like catching the draft or the Peloton, right? It, like it just sucks you in and all of a sudden you're battling with these dudes and, and, you know, I'm fortunate. Um, your brother's fortunate, Steve, uh, Hayden, like, you know, there was a bunch of us that were like, we fed off each other, man. And we were like yeah. so competitive. And I know your guys's group was the same way. Like, I, I mean, we were kids watching you guys and, mm-hmm. um, and we, we watched how competitive and like, Dude, you guys were cutthroat, man. You guys were battled gnarly, man. And um, I think that, I think that the way you guys raced and the way BMX Action portrayed you guys actually drove our group to want to be that group. Yeah. Well, your um, your group wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for the Orange Y. Agreed. There's I no think no way that was like a national every night. Yeah, dude. It, yeah, that, yeah. That Orange Y was. Fuck. I, I say the story often on here, but you know, it, it's true. I would go to orange Y on a Friday night or a Wednesday night and get third or fourth in a main. And then I could go to the national on the weekend and win. Yeah. I mean, it was, that was a, that was a thing. <laughs> it happened a lot. <laughs> so, but you know, it's, it's um that competitive fire, man. And it was, you know, it, it uh, I, but yeah, your guys's group, I think you guys had, far side and Richie was also in that group in the terrible 10. And uh, I think Daryl Young was in there. So yeah, guys- they're a little, they're a little bit younger. 
Yeah. Yeah. They didn't yeah. race you all the time, but they were part of that terrible 10. Yeah. Pine that, was in there also. Yeah. And that, that I, I, well, I can't speak for the other guys that I raced, but I know when I saw that in the magazine, I thought that was like, oh my gosh, that's like the Holy grail of wow. Like it was, it, yeah. I thought it was a great article. It was a cool concept. And, um, and, uh, cause you know, before that it was always pros, 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 pros. And then a little blue blurb here about different amateurs that are really fast, but that to me that really highlighted that these you could be a superstar as an amateur as well. Mm -hmm. You're not biased because you were in there like twice or so, right? Yeah, well, that's. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I, hate, well, I, I don't think. Should, I, personally, I don't think they should have done it. Like I think that they should have just done it the one time that they did it. Like like you guys, they did it once with you guys, and then they didn't do it. Yeah, and I thought that made it really special. And then when they did it with us, I got in the first time, and some people argue that I shouldn't have been in on the first time. Who who would argue that? I don't know. Some guys. <laughs> <laughs> well, just to, uh, name one guy that would argue. I think that. this. I think there's a guy back east from Philly, Judd Ciencio. <laughs> may argue that. <laughs> <laughs> Judd's, Judd's a good. Judd is a, a, a dear friend of mine and Mike's. We worked with him at Hyper and um, we always would discuss it. And uh, and Judd had, he, he had legs to stand on with that argument at the time because I hadn't really done a lot, but I, I definitely proved my worth. But my point is, I thought it was really special that you guys, they did it once with you guys. And then I, then they did it with us and then they did it again and they did it again. And I think it kind of diluted it a little bit. And then, so I, I, I wish they had have just done it one time and kept it special. I disagree. I love that they had it. Oh yeah, I thought it was great. Yeah, I, thought it was I love great. they had it every time. I wish they had it every year. <laughs> I thought it was because because it made for great reading and great it, argument. Right. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Because there's, there's, there's never there's always enough the East Coast guys kind of left out. Right. Right. Dude, and <laughs> Quark would rub it in too. Because he would post a 10, and then he would give the honorable mentions. He would give the fourth place in the semi-trophy at the junior high school races. <laughs> and, dude, it would be better if your name wasn't an honorable mention, man. Because <laughs> and, and at least you could pretend they forgot about you, if not. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> uh, you know, and, and poor Judd Ciencio, man. He's, he, he, could, he could and should have been in the terrible 10 he won so many races but yep. the if you have a conversation with him today you'll you'll say you know hey man can you send me send me 10 of these he goes oh 10 you know i should have been the terrible 10 <laughs> That's <a> true story. <laughs> it is great we love all right well do you buy it i mean it's i don't want i got these two guys down here let's we could talk about judd another time we could talk about that for a long time um i do have a question for you guys you've traveled all over um is there a and this is a just a basic standard question but i'm curious any track when you think about races do you think of one track that you just say this was the best track i ever raced at maybe you didn't win or you didn't do well but you're like this track was awesome anything first come to mind guilford connecticut wow Wow. I, like I think the dirt was like, it was motocross. That was hero dirt there. You know, definitely was. Just I've never like, heard of that. That's crazy. Yeah. Guilford, Connecticut. And it was one of those cool places that had a nice, cool turn, bowl first turn. And on the top of the, the berm, they would have that snow fencing. So the spectators could be right on top of you wow. there. You know, not like it is these days to where, you know, they got the spectators a mile away. You know, they had that ski fencing right yeah. up on the top of the turn and people could look down on you and yell at you and say whatever they wanted. <laughs> you know, I love it. I think they should bring it back. Yeah, I agree. I, yeah. I agree. You could do it at Dirty Fest, put that ski fencing up on the turn so everybody <laughs> can get right in there. Dude, I, I think we may have no fencing. No fencing. Perfect. Perfect. They can spit on yeah. you when you go by. Eddie. That's what Dude. I like to see and hear. I mean, that's all. That's all the track. That's all it was, right? Like when you. Yeah, exactly. It used to be like tires used to outline the track. Tires. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, 
Lee, when, when, Lee. You lay, when you lay in bed at night and you close your eyes and you think about BMX, like you probably do every night. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what track, seriously, what track comes to mind? Well, I mean, besides the obvious Corona, um, Eddie actually just made me think of when he spoke about spectators, I was lucky enough to race in the halftime show of the Dallas Cowboys Rams playoff game in 78 in front of what does the Coliseum hold? A hundred thousand people. Yeah. And yeah. we basically started in the tunnel with a rubber band start, went down that straightaway, hit a bunch of wooden ramps, went behind the goal post and did the same thing down the other straightaway. And um, that was, that was pretty cool. That's wild, man. I think yeah. they only did that twice. Um, and I did it the second year. The first year was, I think, 76 or seven or something. Um, but I, I did it one year and I think only did it twice. Yeah. Pretty what about awesome. you, JV? Guilford, Connecticut. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, best track. Um, probably, probably uh, Nashville for the World Cup. The one I think about is the one you know you see it in magazines all the time, and then to finally go there. I think that one to me, I, and then the two doubles, you know, down the first straight. Yeah. EC, what about you? Close your eyes at night and you think about BMX. Yeah, Louisville by a mile for me. Yeah, you've mentioned that, Louisville. Dude, That's I just. your track. I loved, I don't know whoever built those berms at Louisville, but the way they built them was, they were like perfection. There's so many, you can ride any line in the corner and come out with the same amount of speed. So if you were, you know, there was, even if you were in fifth, you could still take a different line and still come out in the mix. And so for me, I loved it. I mean, I always like, it's no secret. I love cornering and it, that's one of the things I did really good. So I never felt like I was out of the race, right? I could I could blow my gate and be in sixth place in the first turn. <clears throat> and Eddie, I know your brother probably would say the same thing because he was pretty magical on that track as well. And you just, you could bide time. You could actually like, you knew you could relax. There was, you know, you could get one or two in the first turn, one or two in the second corner. Um, and then going around towards the, the finish line, the way that were uh, going in the last corner and how it, it came out of the last corner. It kind of had this dog leg and you could, if you knew how to line it up, you could actually hit the step jump and kind of take a straight line down the last straight instead of making it a dog leg. And you could usually squeak by a few guys on the inside there. So, um, you know, not many guys knew that line, how to come off the last turn and then straight line to the finish. But man, like it was so, there were so many little nuances in the corners and the way they were, cupped and pocketed man so for me louisville by a mile i love that place mm. mike interesting you know what uh, like leah it's it's corona raceway and if i'm not thinking about corona it's rancho <laughs> those two my two favorite tracks and and rancho for the speed and corona for everything else corona was a great track had everything there had everything i high speed I, low speed cornering I wish I had been older when, when I, you know, I, I got to go to Corona when I was 10 and I think that, what was it done in like 81, 82, 81, I think. Yeah. So I didn't get to, I really, I was scared to death, honestly. I mean, I was really scared. I crashed there on the first jump, like at, at the bottom of the starting hill. I was scared to death, man. I'd never fallen. I'd never fallen off of anything going that fast and <laughs> felt my body be out of control. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like when you fall off a motorcycle, you, that, that inertia you feel when you fall off a motorcycle, your body is out of control. You literally are just cartwheeling and, and stuff's flipping around. And when you crash at Corona, when you're going that fast, it feels the same way. I was scared to death, dude. I didn't want to go to that start hill. So <laughs> I wish I'd been a little bit older and so then I could have probably liked it more because I loved watching it and hearing the guys, how fast they would go around the first corner. You could hear them coming. It was amazing. 
I wonder how fast we were really going because the urban legend keeps growing and there's no mm. way we were going as fast as people are trying to make it sound. No, <laughs> I know. I don't, yeah. People, <laughs> people say now we were doing 70 and I'm sure we were only doing 60. <laughs> but, but the thing here's the thing about it though right like think about the bikes and the wheelbases that's i think that's what made it was the perception right like of, of course it felt like you were going 60 you were on a wheelbase this big there's no stability yeah well hey let me ask you this what gearing did you run there eddie At 45 cross. 16 or 44 no you know what i take it back i run was taller than that it was probably 47 16 yeah wow i may have came down to 46 later i was always 48 to 52 holy yeah Yeah. what yeah so maybe we were going 70 yeah (laughs) i i ran 50 i ran 52 16 until i got a 14 tooth sprocket and then it was game on then it was like you could yeah. really get going. That was the yeah. first time I never spun out. You guys really ran 48s and 52s. Oh, yeah. I'd and never you, heard and of you that. Would run out of, Me and either. Listen, and you would run out of gear on the first on, on the Dude, first I track. raced there and I didn't know about that. Again, yeah. I was 10, but still. Well, well, what's funny about that is so when I, again, racing the, the Wells races, and then we'd go show up at the 2 o'clock races, and I was getting smoked. And my dad was talking to one of the parents, and we knew nothing about gearing. Absolutely nothing. And one of the parents goes, well, you probably need to get him a bigger sprocket. My dad was like, what are you talking about? And he goes, well, he's, your son has no gear at the bottom. But, you know, I'm, I was just completely spun out. So we went to, and I don't know if you remember this bike shop, Mike, but we went to Andy's bike shop. Oh, yeah. Over there off of um, Hull. Yep. Yep. And, and we got probably the biggest one they sold. And I don't know if I ever lost a race there for who knows how long after get, just changing the gear. Dude, how stoked were you when you just pushed into that beat? <laughs> yeah. You were so pumped. You had to buy two extra chains just to make it, <laughs> make it fit. Double master I'm, links. I'm sure that there's a bicycle distributor somewhere going, why are all these bike shops in Riverside buying 52 tooth sprockets <laughs> <laughs> and 14 tooth cogs for the coaster brake? <laughs> yeah, it's am- amazing. Uh, amazing. Well, what gear do you think they run? Chula Vista had the that you know the newer track that was straight down the starting gate. I mean, are they not even running high gears? No, not those like guys. That. Yeah, I don't think they they the start is so important that I don't think they I don't think they run big gears. Mm. JV, think think of Chula Vista. Yeah, now take take that hill and stack five more of those hills on top of it. That God. was Corona. That was Corona. <laughs> and now think of that. Think of Chula Vista stacking five hills on top, and then you, then you start off, and then four hills down, put a jump on the downhill. <laughs> yeah, but it wasn't. It was just a jump. That was no backside. Just a yeah, jump. It was just it was one jump. Off. It was, it a, was drop a drop off, off. Actually, yeah. <laughs> and and imagine you're Lee Medland, and you you before you get your fifty two tooth sprocket. <laughs> And so you took your 44 and you took about four pedals and then you're done. Pedaling. You're already here. Yeah. <laughs> and then you're coasting. Well, so all you hear is. <laughs> Literally. And then you hit the jump. It goes. <laughs> <laughs> and you start again. And that's, a, I swear to God, that's exactly what it was like. God. And then you waited until the track went uphill into the first turn. And that's when you slowed down again. That's when you came back to your gear. Wow. Was amazing. We had yeah, nothing like that. So different. Well, and then you went to Rancho and it was the polar opposite where you started <laughs> really slow, pushing a super hard gear. Wound up. To, yep. And then you get you just wound it up. And then once you once you wound it up, the turn you carry you had you carried your speed in all the turns. Because if you if you lost your momentum, you weren't gonna get it back again. It was Daytona. Yeah. <laughs> we need to we need if we do another dirty fest, we need to do we need to. This track isn't that fast. We need to ramp it up a little bit. Hey, slow down, <laughs> Junior. Some of us have to yeah. go to work on Monday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. A lot of people are asking about that. <laughs> a lot of people are concerned about that. Just for the video, they're concerned are about Are they that. really? Yeah. 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 Absolutely. One guy sent the note through the 
website was want, wanted elevation. Like, what is the elevation drop? I go, I don't know. <laughs> it's not like that. Yeah. I, I go, watch the video. Bikes, I don't... Yeah. BMX, not mountain bikes. <laughs> elevation. Depends on how high you're on the sea post. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man! All right, so we talked a little bit. I got just a couple more standard questions. I got to ask you because people will want to know. Of all the bikes that you raced, of all the bikes that you raced, what was your favorite? I'm right, talking to you two. By the way, I'm talking to you two. Yeah, Jackass. go ahead. Lee. Lee already said his. I already said mine. Mine was cool. Well, right. Yeah, but I tell me really why. Like tell bike. us why. The, and by the way, the first the first generation one, the ones like gusset in the front. The, the black one with the gold wheels that that um the, my first time when I was on the team with Kevin that was that was better in my opinion than the second generation one I think they called the laser light or something I didn't like that one quite as much um I don't know I think I just I had a lot of success on it but it just felt it just felt really good the GT obviously was a really good bike but I think I was you know kind of like Eddie we stopped growing pretty young <laughs> um, by the time I was 15 or 16 I was done growing during the early years on my GT, I was I was growing, and maybe that's why that bike wasn't the greatest because I never felt like it really fit me that well. But once I landed on that for, that first Kuhar, I really liked that bike, and that's about when I stopped growing. So it probably had something to do with that. Interesting. Yep, Eddie, what about you? Favorite bike of all time? I liked them all. I mean, the DG was really good when I was younger. Um, the Torker was really good indoors, I thought. Uh, the Diamondback um, was good for photos. <laughs> 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 had cool stickers. <laughs> yeah, I had cool stickers. <laughs> the Diamondback was great for the bike show. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, those Diamondbacks, honestly, Eddie, they always looked off. Yeah. Like, yeah. from the side, they look – I mean, the only bikes that I think looked worse from the side were Pistol Pete, CW, and Haro. <laughs> Could be. They, yep. You know, at the end of my career, I rode a Patterson for a while. Some people know that. Some people could tell that, you know, towards the end of the career, that I, I think I already knew I was going to get 86 from the team or whatever. So they told me I could run whatever I wanted to run, you know. And how'd you like that? I like the Patterson a lot. Yeah. Mentally and physically, I was already burnt out and gone from the sport for the most part. But it rode mm. really well, you know. A lot of people well, love them. Yeah. Yeah. I've never heard anyone anyone say a bad word about the Patterson. Yeah. Wow. All right, you're getting your lane assignments. Who's the one person you didn't want to be next to on the gate? Ronnie Anderson by a long shot. Oh, really? Are you kidding? <laughs> Not even say anymore? Come on. <laughs> what about you, Eddie? I don't know. I never really thought of that. You know, I just, I just wanted, I was just happy just to make the main. And then from there, you know, obviously I would just focus not on who was next to me or anything, but just how to uh, be able to step it up to another level, you know, because everybody's good by the time you get to the main event, you know, I mean, Ronnie would have his antics and everything else. And um, certain people you knew didn't have a good first pedal. And that was probably one of our better things on a Diamondback was we had better first pedals than a lot of people. And then some people may have had a little better, you know, power and strength down the straightaway. Um, so it really, I didn't really care about who was next to me at the time. I would have thought you'd say Liz Torres. <laughs> Could be. <laughs> Mike, I don't know. Did I ever, ask, I don't know if I ever asked you guys what on that. Who did you not want to be next to? Mm, Sean, Texas. And why? Just because he's big? He, uh, he ran his bars crooked, and uh, oh, you know, he right. purposely set his bars up sideways. And right. you, you don't know you don't know what was going to happen. <laughs> One, two, three pedals into it. I mean, that is the PC way to say it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, seriously. And he could he could 
actually just hit the gate or he could flip for no reason. He just, and he was so big, he took up a lane and a half. <laughs> no. Now, I'm not kidding. I mean, he, he took up a lot of space. <laughs> yeah, and, it's true. And, and if you got a, just a half a wheel behind out of the gate and he was, you know, a little bit in your lane, he, if he was a little bit in your lane, he was a lot of bit in your lane. So, yeah, Sean, Texas, for sure. EC? Yeah. Uh, I'd say probably mm, probably Veltman. Yeah. Steve was – he, especially when there was, like, a first jump that you'd pedal over, because, man, he would get into some of those crazy, like, those con- – Corded body positions, and it always seemed like man, I'd always catch my handlebars on his jersey or something, you know, because he was just so gumby and over the jumps and stuff. And uh, he always had he was pretty fast out of the gate, man. So, when it often, if I depending on which way the first turn went, if I was on the inside of him and I and he was going, especially if he's going fast that weekend, I would. As soon as I saw lane choice, I would already, I'd start planning like, okay, what, 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 if I'm going to try to get my best start, what's the B plan? <laughs> it's already on the B plan. I would already be like strategizing. Okay. Who's, who's coming with him? Is he in lane eight or like, you know, it's like, okay, do I let him come over and shut the pack down and then cruise around the outside and try to get a second, third place out of the first turn, that type of stuff, you know, versus just trying to fight with him and tangle bars with him and, and then ruin the whole race. So, but Steve always seemed like he was, he was always fast and powerful, man. What about you, JB? Shit. I mean, I was uh, like Eddie, I'm happy to make the main, but you know, getting lined up against like Rick Palmer, Kevin Hall. I mean, I wasn't a big, I wasn't very big. So I felt like those guys were monsters, you know, compared to me next to them. Didn't feel comfortable, but, uh, but yeah, I think I think Rick Palmer for me getting next to him, I was like, oh shit, <laughs> he's coming Palmer right over. Big. He's coming right over. <laughs> <laughs> he was a big dude. Yeah. Well, you're talking to two guys right here on this podcast that were not big dudes. No, but fast out of the yeah. gate. You, you both were very fast out of the gate. You won races. Uh, you know, and everyone knew you. You both were not going to make a lot of mistakes. So if you were in the gate, if I was in the gate with either one of you you had to be on your game because you knew if, if I made a mistake or if another pro, if you made a mistake, you guys were going to be right there. Yeah, and exactly. if you got good gate starts, it was going to be hard work to beat you. The, uh, but uh, one thing a lot of people I don't think know is that you're both good jumpers because you, you, neither one of you did a lot of it. Didn't get a lot of magazine shots of you guys jumping, but you were both good jumpers. I disagree. I don't know about Eddie, but I I never really considered myself a good jumper. I um what? I didn't work on it. I didn't care. My goal was just to go fast. Um, ever since I left Snipes that day, and somebody told me you're not supposed to jump off the jumps, <laughs> I um I didn't really care about that <laughs> stuff. To be honest with you, my hot shots and 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 when Osborne used to do those hot shots was pretty embarrassing. If you ever see that picture, I'm literally in midair like this. <laughs> <laughs> like so i don't even want to want to claim that that i was a good jumper i was afraid good. to jump distance and height and all that stuff but as far as style what nah i didn't have it listen you had it in that you, no matter how big the jumps were and this is this is where i'm going with this no matter how big the jumps were no matter how steep or how long or how wide you both you both of you would jump them no problem and you would always do it very smooth and you always did have both of you had a little bit of style. It wasn't big, gnarly, whatever, but you were both good jumpers. Lee, I, I I see I see your post of you riding your mountain bike, and you still got that 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 table X up. Yeah, I'm a much better jumper on my mountain bike than I ever was on a BMX bike. For sure, I don't know. You you I you, know, you, you started that at, you started that on a twenty inch, bro. I don't know, man. It's I think just those big old wheels, everything happens slower in the air. It's, it's, I agree with you on that. I would never jump a BMX bike now, man. I won't even ride one. No, (laughs) hell no. (laughs) Well, I'm grateful, Lee, that you're not a fantastic, phenomenal style jumper. Because remember, 
my first shot in the magazine was because I tagged along with you and Kevin. And you guys were not, neither one of you were like, pow, pow. neither one of you were John Cruz. You were probably the only one in Riverside that was a good jumper. No. Oh, no. Who? Okay, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what about jumping Jim Pratt? Yeah, jumping Jimmy Pratt. No, I didn't. I didn't say fearless jumper. I just said no jumper. No, we all did love to jump, though. We all did love to jump. Well, EC, any other, any anything else? No, man, it's just been awesome. Like, I mean, I these guys are good friends of mine, but you know, like, like often with uh, some of the guests we have, these guys were, you know. I don't want to say local heroes, but as a kid growing up, watching these guys race was super awesome for me. And um, so getting to chat with them now is is awesome about this old stuff. I mean, I actually spent a lot of time with Lee when we both were done racing. We raced motorcycles for what I think me, you and Tommy raced for a couple of years. We would yeah. just race the Friday night races out at Paris and some of the stuff out of Glen Helen. So I, I've actually got to spend a lot of time with Lee and uh so you know it's it's i'm fortunate to have somebody that i looked up to like that as a kid to like be able to have done that stuff and then obviously getting to spend time with eddie dirt uh frogtown was dude that was <laughs> that was amazing actually. so um i don't have nothing to add man i'm just grateful that i you know you guys came on the show and we were able to to chat with you guys it's always a good time for me so i love that yeah, same same here, Lee. We've never got a chance to meet in person, but uh, have definitely knew about you and 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 watched you race. I mean, back back in the day. So I really appreciate you coming on and uh, me getting to spend some time with you. It's, it's awesome. And Eddie, uh, you know, we go back a little ways, so it's always great seeing you. And I see you got. Uh, I'm liking that what, shirt you just. Put what on. in the shit are you wearing? <laughs> see that. Oh, oh, that's Woodward. Oh, oh, that's what I'm talking that's about. That's Woodward. <laughs> that is that was what when, I'm talking that was when about. You, that's when everyone changed roles, and you would like, you would do a, a routine. <laughs> Look at Hollywood. He can't believe it. <laughs> I'll tell you the story. I had this shirt at Dirty Fest, and I was late to the uh, to the uh, to the actual podcast. And I just didn't feel right that that'd be the greatest place for me to throw it out there, you know, drop the bomb and everything else. Cause it was going pretty smoothly and everything. <laughs> so my idea was to save this thing and do it for the podcast when it came on. I love probably it. Wear it. I'll probably wear it when I go to Dirty Fest. Yes. One of the days. Probably the campfire. That's right. The 80s party. <laughs> wear that to the 80s exactly. party? Yes. Do you know the story behind that? Do you guys We're know the story? To find out. Let's hear it. So every, every year at Woodward Camp, the gymnasts have this one day it's summer where all the gymnast guys dress up as the gymnast girls, you know, and they do the stuff, the toilet paper and wear the mascara and what have you. And they do a floor exercise. And then the uh, all the girls, the girl gymnasts dress like guys and they put the fake mustaches on and they do a floor exercise. And it's all in good fun. Well, the, we all of us BMXers went the first year we watched it and we were like, oh, you know, it's funny. It was kind of funny, whatever. But the second year, uh, one of the uh, one of the girls, Casey Drass, had taught me how to do a backflip. And so we'd gone in at night and we'd work on a little handspring or uh, what you, handsprings and whatnot, doing a few things. So as a last minute entry into the women's division, oh a, a BMXer <laughs> shows up with all the all the stuff. And I did a floor routine, which was, you know, I was, that was terrible, but it was funny. Yeah. <laughs> and never, never in a million years would I think 40 years later, 40, 39 years later, that would come back to haunt me. <laughs> I remember the picture too. I love it. I thought I burned every copy of that thing. <laughs> Man, and I'm going to have to know. I'm going to have to know. Have to know here on today's world. Pictures. We're a lot of things happened in Woodward. <laughs> I, you're right, Lee. I could have been a contender. <laughs> I, I could, Were you on the swim I, team too? I, I could have identified and been a contender. <laughs> Instead, 
fourth place in the semi. <laughs> it's junior high. Joe, yeah. I got his fourth place in the semi. Oh, oh man. So well, listen, uh, you guys are, you know, you, you've both been close friends of mine for a long time. Uh, it's funny how Lee, you were, you were a, you know, you probably didn't know it, but you were a hero of mine because we live close to each other, but you were a hero of mine. And, and I hated Eddie King <laughs> and, and through the years, especially late in the career and, and certainly since then, I, you know, I've come to love, absolutely love Eddie King. I, I'd say he's one of my closest friends, dearest friends. I love him to death. Yeah. We kind of grew out of our anger. Yeah. I love Eddie King. It never, it never was an anger. It was just basically, you know, you went to the races, you got into your race mode and you, you know, you're not supposed to like somebody because you got to compete against them. And then, you know, you go home on Monday or Sunday night and it, it is what it is. Yeah. You know? I don't know if I like Lee Medlin now. Oh, you guys! Are, now, now you've turned out to be, you know, both of you have been heroes and brothers to me, and and uh, we're we're great. We are absolutely grateful you guys came on and spent the time here with us. Thank you. We gotta do a ride together. Uh, yep, love riding with Eddie and I and Lee. We keep trying. We'll, we're, we will ride together. I've already ridden with Eddie. I've ridden with EC, and you just keep dodging me, man. Well, yep. <laughs> JV, you're next. You're going to ride with me next. <laughs> hey, see? Well, you know, if you would ever just, you know, learn how to jump, maybe I'd ride with you. <laughs> I told you I'm a better jumper on a mountain bike now. <laughs> you are a better jumper. There'll be a lot of editing in this one, boys. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of letting it fly. <laughs> <laughs> just imagine oh uh, the time lee medlin made out with kim johnson oh <laughs> oh yeah and that uh that one time with kevin mcneil i'll just leave it at that <laughs> <laughs> oh eddie you gotta do me a favor man take a picture of or, or yeah take a selfie with the shirt on and send it to me because I want to make sure I put it on the screen really clear and close so everyone can. Absolutely. You got that. Me. I love it. Yeah. For sure. Hey, yeah. seriously. Yeah. Thank you guys. You, your, your champs, your friends, your rivals to this day. Love it. <laughs> Thank love you guys. guys. Bye, guys. Yes. Yeah, boys. Hey, this is John Cruz. Uh, no, we're not having an earthquake. I have Parkinson's. What, what do you think of that, Michael? Uh, some we ought to pitch in and get you a gimbal. <laughs> <laughs> that would be nice. But, but seriously, um, this is John Cruz. Uh, and uh, I obviously have, have something going on. And I was diagnosed with Parkinson's 20 years ago this year, actually. Um, so, uh, I've, I've chosen the Davis Finney Foundation over the years to be my voice for Parkinson's. If you're not familiar with the Davis Finney Foundation, Davis Finney is one of the winningest cyclists in American history. Uh, he's the roadie, if you guys yeah, remember those roadies out there, um, all that lycra and stuff, but uh, he is just a great man. Um, when he was diagnosed with Parkinson's, he decided to make a difference in people's lives. Um, and his, his choice was to start a foundation. And that foundation uh, obviously wishes for a cure for Parkinson's because there is no cure at this time. But they recognize that you have to live with Parkinson's. And your caregivers are having to live and take care of us. And the Davis Finney Foundation, that's what they do, is they only look for a cure, but they look for uh, ways to enhance the quality of life for Parkinson's sufferers and their caregivers. So uh, I appreciate all of you supporting the Davis Finney Foundation. Uh, it certainly means a lot to me. Um, I know we all have something, right? So I think it's important to 
give back to our communities, whether it's BMX or a, a foundation that's close to your heart. If you don't have one, please choose mine. I appreciate you. Well, thank you, John Cruz. You certainly have made a difference in a lot of lives, including mine, and giving us the opportunity to do something good for somebody else is, is fantastic. So thank you, thank you so much. And on behalf of John Cruz, please find a way to give something to the Davis Finney Foundation on behalf of John Cruz, the Dirty Knobs, and your entire BMX family. Thank you very much. Well, I hope you enjoyed that one, you bunch of dirty knobs. So please do that. Subscribe. Hit the subscribe button. Comment if you have anything to say. We'd love to hear it. And uh, we will be back out here in two weeks with another one. And thanks to our sponsors. Speaking of which, we are going to read some commercials to you now. Thanks for uh, showing our sponsors the love because they're showing it to us. Thanks again. And uh, we'll catch up to you soon. And then sing it out right now. All right, coming live and direct from the Colt Clubhouse in Santa Ana, California. Come on down and get all your BMX needs. We're giving away free air for your tires. <laughs> That's all I got, brother. That's great. That's great. All right. Now. It's perfect. That's perfect. <laughs> Kenda, designed for your journey on the road, on the trail, or on the racetrack, you can count on Kenda quality. Our tires are engineered for performance and value across a wide range of interests and applications. See why Kenda is the right choice. It's your move. Imagine how bikes can lead to a healthier, more connected world. Bikes set us apart, free to explore and move, and experience our relationships with people and places like nothing else can. At Saris, we don't just imagine a more bikeable world. We're all in, making it happen. As our Sun Tour shares, your passion of cycling. We are committed to giving you the highest level of service in the industry, along with products that hopefully will exceed your expectations. Serving riders is the cornerstone of our business, and we pride ourselves in doing it. Hopefully. <laughs> hopefully. Velocity Bike Park is the premier bike park for riders in Southern California. With 25 miles of world-class trails, obstacles, flow track, and races for mountain biking, gravel, and BMX. Ultramax, no matter what size tube you have, we have one thicker. If you're a racer and use your tube really fast or you're in the cruiser class and have a bigger tube, we gotcha. Our tubes don't go flat because our tubes are thicker. Our tubes will not be found where young people hang out or for rent at any time. But you can still get an Ultramax t-shirt at dirtyknobs.com. Hi everybody, Toby Henderson, founder of Box, co-founder of American BMX Companies, the owner of Race Inc., Botima, and Cook Brothers Racing. We brought these two companies together to bring you the best quality product you can get for a BMX bike. We're all about the rider, so please check out our Level Up and Rider First programs. See you at the track. ODI Grips, the world leader in grip technology. Home of the lock-on grip system. Check them out over at www.odigrips.com. 4416 Designs Commercial, take one. There you go. <laughs> All right, 4416 Designs. We make shirts, but we don't sell them. Uh, we're just giving back to the sport. If you're out at Ukaipa BMX and you need a shirt, hit me up. I'll hook you up with one. Yeah, I love that. Mega Design Group is a full-service marketing firm. They handle everything from logos to advertising to packaging. Having over 25 years' experience in the print and marketing fields they can handle any hurdle check it out at megadesigngroup.com cool stop brake pads high performance bicycle brake pads since 1977 
Check them out at coolstop.com. That's K O O L S T O P.com. Supercross BMX. What can we say? Our lives revolve around BMX. Founded in 1989 to build the ultimate BMX race frame, they've never strayed from that vision. Hey, for more details, check it out at supercrossbmx.com. Hey everyone, this is Brian Wilson with ProGate. We are the official gate supplier for UCI and the Olympics. We even make a gate that you can practice on in your driveway at home. Wait a minute, who else are you making a gate for? We're making a gate for Dirty Fest. You guys got to come and check it out. Whatever Dirty Fest needs for this track, we're going to supply it. We're not some French knockoff, you know. We're the gold standard in BMX gates. And make sure to check us out at progate.net and bmxtracksupply.com. And we'll see you at Dirty Fest for sure. Take care, everybody. Hey, folks, this is Mike Rodriguez, a.k.a. Mr. Crit. I've been racing and making number plates since 1980. You know, like when they used to do one pedal starts. But you know, Crip Blade has been around for 43 years. The last four decades, the who's who of BMX have raced a crit number plate straight to the handlebars. And you know, you get that guy, Mike Savage, the international man of BMX, still doing it strong. And you know, back in the day, the plates used to be reversible because there was multiple sanctions. And you could put, you know, one sanction on one side, one on the other. Now you just got one. But crit is still reversible. And that logo is still on the back. For guys like Mike and your rad guys, you know, like Mike Miranda, who would turn those handlebars and twist them up. And we got it rad just for you. All right. Hey, where will we see those plates? Those plates you can see at every single bike shop that, that, that stocks BMX stuff in the USA and Canada. And where will you be at? Will you be in an event sometime soon? Damn, I'm sponsoring the Dirty Fest. And I can't wait to come out to Southern California and, and get dirty. Amy grips, still made here in the USA, used by world champions like me, Tommy Brackens. If you want to know more about the best grips on earth, go to amy.com. If you have a Senna cycling helmet, you know what it's like to ride connected. Senna got their start in communications for the motorcycling industry, where they're now a leader. Senna brought their same tech that goes into those helmet-to-helmet -helmet motorcycle communication systems into cycling helmets. Senna bike helmets have an integrated microphone and two speakers hidden right into the shell. Senna helmets connect together on a mesh or Bluetooth network so you can talk to your friends while you ride without shouting over wind noise, even if you're not side by side. That's super cool, especially in the trails. Senna helmets also pair with smartphones so you can listen to your playlist without blocking out ambient noise and you can take phone calls and even hear turn by turn GPS directions. Ready? <laughs> and that's going in. Yeah. <laughs> We need a doing. All right. What's your nickname for uh, for like from the mic? Do you have a no? I don't. You don't have. I don't really have a nickname. It's just Mike. Oh, just Mike on the mic. Name my app. That's, <laughs> she got one. That's getting edited. Yeah. <laughs> We're putting that in. Hi, I'm Mike Miller, author of Day One by Michael Miller. And a special offer going out. Anybody who buys the book between now and Dirty Fest, which is April 28th through 30th, I'm going to take all the money from the book and send it to the Davis Finney Foundation for those with Parkinson's. So get your copy on Amazon.com and we'll make a donation. Hey, what was the name of that book again? Day One by Mike, Michael Miller, which is me. I'm sorry. Hey, what was that name again? Day One by Michael Miller. Hey, support the podcast that support us, our friends, uh, the fine folks over there at All Things BMX, which is our favorite Wednesday night live podcast, as you know. Uh, our buddies over there at Beer Budget BMX, uh, Big Bike BMX and bmx weekly check them out check them out our friends what's up everybody it's your friend isaac from big bike bmx and i've got a podcast with my best friend 80s bmx craig 
Yep. And guess what, you guys, if you have enjoyed your time here on the Dirty Knobs podcast, we'd love for you guys to come over and hang out with us at Big Bike BMX, where we've got all your old school legends and BMX from the past and today at Big Bike BMX. Isaac, come check us out. We'd love the opportunity to win you over. And if not, hey, it's just another place to talk about BMX with your grimy friends. It's fun. Hey, Dale Holmes, I want to tell you something. One of my favorite podcasts that I never miss is BMX Weekly. Even though it has an accent, I still love it. <laughs> Cheers, Mike. You can get all the podcasts on bmxweekly.com. Old school, mid school, today school. Check it out. Yeah, BMX Weekly. <laughs> hey, here we go. Hey, Beer Budget BMX, baby. Coming out you live from the beer budget studios over here at the hack shack quarantine oh man we're coming in hotter than satan's nutsack yeah we are dirtier than an alabama strip club where reclass pros go and get lap dances by their half sister yeah the only show that'll make you second guess your life choices like a amish on an e-bike hey if you guys enjoy what you just listened to make sure you tune in every wednesday night to the all things bmx show the only live streaming podcast show in the game right now even ask mike he's been on vicente's been on still waiting for that other guy to come on the show you can find us on youtube twitch and facebook and you can also find us at all things bmx show.com keep it dirty <laughs> I don't know if I told you boys, my dad used to he'd eat, a, eat a jalapeno and then he would wipe it all over his lips. And then he, my nephews and nieces and I, he, he, oh, come here, come here, give, give me, come here, give your dad a big kiss. And no he would way. kiss you on the lips. No, he would yeah, not. My dad would kiss me on the lips and he'd go, hey. <gasps> freak out. He'd, he'd do it to my mom, he'd kiss my mom on the lips. He'd smoke us. He does hilarious. <laughs> That's pretty funny. You, we need to make a tech inspection. Yeah. For the suspension class. For everything. Your suspension has to work. And 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 if you get caught cheating, we're gonna spray paint your bike. <laughs> <laughs> we're, gonna spray, we're gonna spray paint it neon orange or some some kind of shit Make it, <laughs> we're spray painted pink it's the, the bike of shame purple thing on the spot on the spot we spray paint everything i don't even think we should spray paint it i think it should get a bucket of paint just whoosh, yep just glop it on yeah just everything. throw the bucket Tires, everything yep. just Steam. whoosh oh and while it's wet yeah because that won't dry no and now you have to race it that's right. We'll that's have to your... repaint the gate after every one of his motos. Man. That's the tech inspection. Uh, you yeah. know what? I'm writing that in the rule book. <laughs> it's so good. Huh? There are going to be some pissed off people. <laughs> if you don't pass tech inspection, oh. you're throwing a if bucket. If you're caught of... cheating you get a in bucket. tech inspection, we're go we, we are going to we are going to pour paint on your bike. <laughs> <laughs> that's a great rule right don't you that's i mean instant gratification i like it <laughs> I, and everybody I mean, would know I, we'll we'll be gratified yeah. while After we're like six feet under the ground this, these videos are going to surface somewhere too. <laughs> <laughs> no. this external hard drive when we're done with this one i'm going to take a ball peen hammer to this external hard drive <laughs> <laughs>